Have you ever wondered where the television signal you are watching is coming from? Welcome to True North. Good evening and welcome to Maine Watch. Sixty years of television, seven decades of telling the stories of Maine's people, places, history, culture, music, and so much more. Maine public has changed a lot since those early black and white days, but what hasn't changed is the mission to use the medium of television to connect each of us with our neighbors, our state, the world, to educate, entertain, and inform. As Maine Public celebrates its 60th anniversary, we thought it would be an appropriate time to rewind and look at how we got here and where we've been. We've scoured the vaults to find highlights throughout the years, all the way back to the first broadcast day of November 13th, 1961. Television first came to Maine in 1953 when WABI in Bangor went on the air. As the decade progressed, more stations appeared, featuring local programs of all sorts. And while these stations did broadcast some shows for education's sake, a national movement worked towards building a network of stations where non-commercial education was the focus. This tractor may pull itself out of the mud hole, or it may tip over. If it tips over, the fellow operating the tractor may not be one of the lucky ones. Organizing the family business is one of the things that families like to do in order to keep papers well organized. In 1960, Colby, Bates, and Bowdoin Colleges began the work to establish Maine's first educational TV station. And on November 13, 1961, the nation's 60th ETV station hit the airwaves, reaching viewers from Waterville to Portland. At the same time, the University of Maine system had been working towards building a network that would serve the rest of the state. And with the voters' approval of a bond in June of 1962, the groundwork for what became MPBN began. Maine ETV, as it was called, hit the air October 7, 1963, and within a year reached audiences in northern, eastern, and central Maine, along with parts of New Brunswick, Canada. With the addition of WMEG in Portland in 1975, most of Maine was now served by public television. In the 50s and 60s, most network programming came from the National Educational Television Network, or NET. You might remember seeing the logo in early episodes of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Then, in 1969, the Public Broadcasting Corporation was formed and, in 1970, took over as the network serving the nearly 100 educational television stations. PBS introduced us to a new world of educational, cultural, and scientific programs. Sesame Street, The Electric Company, Masterpiece, Great Performances, Nova, and many more shows that changed the landscape of television. Throw them away and start all over again. And get a move on. WCBB and MPBN continued to produce original programs that focused on issues of special interest to Mainers. Over the years, there were a few name changes. In the beginning, there was WCBB Channel 10, joined by Maine ETV. In 1971, Maine ETV became the Maine Public Broadcasting Network, or MPBN. With the merger in 1992, the new name of Maine Public Television was born. Then came Maine PBS, then back to MPBN, and finally, in 2016, Maine Public. And it all began 60 years ago. So, to celebrate the diamond anniversary of Maine Public, let's dive into the vault and take a peek at some shows from the past 60 years. You will not only see how television has changed, but how our state has as well. You'll see some old favorites, some of which haven't been seen in decades. And who knows? You might even see yourself. So let's go back to 1961 and see where it all started. 
JFK was president, Jimmy Dean was on the top of the charts, the Reds beat the Yanks into space, but the Yanks beat the Reds on the field, and WCBB was about to go on the air for the very first time. November 13th, 1961. The broadcast day began at 10 a.m. with music theater, but at 8 p.m., this is what viewers saw. Educational television comes to Maine. Welcome to Channel 10. This is the first regularly scheduled program day for WCBB, Channel 10 in Augusta, Maine's first educational television station. It is the beginning of a different kind of television service for Southern Maine, a new service planned to be of benefit to the whole area, and a service which we trust you will enjoy, appreciate, and support. Good evening, and welcome to this first evening of telecasting by Maine's first educational television station. As you know, this station is a direct result of the efforts of the three private colleges, Colby, Bates, and Bowden, hence our call letters, WCBB. Consequently, this is a private enterprise station made possible without state or federal aid. Our station itself is owned by the Colby, Bates, Bowden Educational Telecasting Corporation, which in turn is owned equally by the three colleges. Covering some 54% of the people of this state, we also hope very soon that there will be a statewide network, part of which will be under the University of Maine, so that all of the state will be covered. Now perhaps it is time to say a few words about the other programming which Channel 10 plans to bring to you in the weeks and months which lie ahead. In addition to the programs of instruction which WCBB will be sending out to the schools of the area during the daytime school time hours, Channel 10 plans to bring you on a regular schedule during the evening hours such programs as Television International every Monday night at 7 o'clock. Included in Television International programs will be Prospects of Mankind featuring Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt as permanent moderator. Five Evenings of Great Music by the Boston Symphony Orchestra will be presented live from Symphony Hall over WCBB during the coming months. Included in our news programming will be President Kennedy's press conferences in their entirety. Highlights of events at the United Nations Thursdays on UN Review. These then are some of the highlights of the evening program schedules which WCBB will bring to you. We hope that you will enjoy and look forward to this new and somewhat different television service and that if you do, you will write and tell us so. And so, public television in Maine was off and running. Two years later, on October 7th, 1963, Maine ETV signed on. For viewers that tuned in that afternoon, they were treated to this. And here's one little chair for one of you, and a bigger chair for two more to curl up in. And here's the book we're going to read tonight. But this is too small, isn't it? Yes, we need one that's giant size. Big enough so that we can see the picture. So look up. Look way up, yes. This one isn't big enough. But I think Rusty has a giant size copy of the same one in the book bag. Rusty? Rusty? Yes, Hi, Rusty. Hi. Uh, do you have the giant size copy of this book? Oh, uh, yeah. Good. Would you get, get it on? Good. And uh, the kittens were coming tonight, weren't they? Mm. Meow and Meow too. Mm. I think this is one of their favorite books. They should have been here by now. I don't know what's keeping them. Hmm. I. One of the reasons we wanted to read this is because I know they like it. Oh. Well, they're, they're not, not here. Coming. We'll. We'll just have to read it anyway. They generally come right in the window. Climb up the ivy. <laughs> oh, oh, hello, Meow. Hello, Meow, too. Oh, Rusty, now we're all here. Yeah. And we're all ready. The early years relied on programming from outside the state. But soon, WCBB and Maine ETV produced their own shows. 
very literal from the 1960s survives. Let's start our rewind with one of the oldest programs in the vault. Hi. Hi, my name is Paul Vermeil, and this is the Music in Maine Woodwind Quintet. Now, do you know what quintet means? Yeah? Five instruments, right. Now, wind means, of course, that these instruments are played by blowing into them, and wood means that they are made of wood. Is that right? Right? Are they made of wood, all of them? Yes. Huh? Yes? Uh, the flute flu and the French horn are not made of wood. Oh, you're absolutely right. So the woodwind quintet comprises from left to right a flute, an oboe, a French horn, a bassoon, and a clarinet. So let's get back to the woodwind quintet now. Thank you. We'll start with a piece which is very strange and unusual. And we're sure you've never heard anything like this before. Let me tell you a story. It is the story of many stories. In times long gone by, in the lands of India and China, there was a king of the kings of the sons of Sasan, who ruled over the empire of Persia and the deserts of the east. Good woman, what business brings you here and uh, what do you have in that bowl? It, it is a gift, your majesty, from my son, Aladdin. Why is he giving me a present? What does Aladdin want? Oh, I, I tremble to ask you. His request is so bold. Ask, ask. No harm will come to you. Well, my son has fallen in love with your daughter, Badrubador. Here it is. Now we are saved. Do not be frightened. What, what wouldst thou have? Take me and the princess back to our own land. Convention is in session. Meeting will come to order. The various committees have been hard at work, as you are all aware. The agenda now calls for recommendations from the committee for constitutional support of religion. Mr. President! Mr. President! Mr. President. Mr. President. What, is, what is this open? The lady speak. Now then, ma'am, let's hear what's on your mind. I thank you, sir. You need not patronize us. Wouldn't dream of it, ma'am. The first thing you can do is get that sergeant of arms out of here. All right, sergeant. You can go now. They won't hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing you can do is authorize our stay for the remainder of the convention. We came to stay and we mean to do so or disrupt the proceedings. Yes, we will! Do you think you can control your caucus, ma'am? Of course. 
Do we stay or don't we? Well, why do you want to? These will be boring proceedings. We'll be the judges of that, I think. Well, gentlemen, what do you say? Mr. Oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Are you asking for profanity, sir, in this house of worship? Oh, it'll be worse if we don't, I know, believe me. Mr. Herrick! Mr. President, I put it to you that your desire for haste is suspect. No, sir, it is obvious. We have no time for philosophical fancies. We have to make a constitution now. Do we not want freedom? Is that not the question? Why do we talk of enslaving ourselves? We are here to free ourselves from the bondage to Massachusetts. Educational Television's News and Comment, an in-depth look at Maine News Today. Yeah. So I think we can say that without exception, all these new super tankers will have completely separate and physically independent ballast tanks with no piping connection with the cargo oil tanks. I believe we had another question from the audience. In the corner, please. Uh, Mr. Howe, I have two bumper stickers here. One is oil men are slick operators. I think this is self-explanatory. <laughs> But I have one here, clean oil can start poverty and start progress. Now, I don't know what clean oil is, but I've always been interested in social problems. And if you have something called clean oil that can stop poverty, what in hell have we been spending billions of dollars for many years to try to eliminate poverty in this country? And this really gets me, start progress. Do you come from Maine, sir? No, sir. Would you tell me what you consider progress for our state? Tonight, John Stevens speaks not as commissioner, but as governor of the Passamaquoddy Reservation at Peter Dana Point. I think a lot of good Indians have died for this land. And if we have to die again, okay. Because what else is there left? Not a thing. We can't see, uh, Fighting, fighting over little welfare money. Indians are being educated. Indians are standing on their own feet. They're going to be heard from, and they're going to have to be dealt with. And the state of Maine has not listened one, one bit to all. They, I warned them 20 years ago this was going to happen. They haven't listened. I think uh, if the state of Maine thinks we're going to lay down and die, you know, play dead, they got another thing coming. They got an awful surprise coming. The program you're about to watch is a television simulation. The names, places. North of the Namaskeg was a viewer active television project which was broadcast in November and December of 1971. Its purpose was to present real issues in a simulated circumstance which would allow examination of issues without the heated emotions and prejudices which surround such in real life. We selected as the topic the proposed plant location of Atlantic Canning Company in the small rural town of Freeboro, Maine. We invented the town of Freeboro, Maine on the equally fictitious Namaskeg River as our site. 
This dramatization of a simulated crisis in Freeboro leaves the decision making up to you as a thoughtful viewer. Next week's program will proceed according to your vote. Now we ask you to become a member of the Freeboro Chamber of Commerce. A simulated Chamber of Commerce meeting is about to take place and your vote will help to, to decide what position the Chamber will take in the Freeboro Town Meeting next Thursday. The planning that has gone into this doesn't amount to beans. So I'm not saying I'm 100% opposed to it, but I do think that there's a lot more that should be done before the decision is made. As I said, uh, we're aware of what the public wants, and they'll get what we want as far as we're concerned. They'll get what you want. No, they'll get what they want. This is the public as a whole, not one side. We have to weigh both sides, you know. I hope I helped. Thank you very much. Right windy bays and come home to the sea again. This place of itself from God and nature affordeth as much diversity of good commodities as any reasonable man can wish. Here are more good harbors for ships of all burthens than England can afford, and far more secure from all winds and weathers than any in England, Scotland, France, or Spain. The Europeans knew about the coast of Maine by 1614. They called it Hundred Harbored Maine. Say, mister, can you tell me how to get to Alfred? Alfred? Now, let me see. Alfred. Well, now, it seems to me that you, you head down uh, the road here toward Dry Lake. Keep going the way you're going. And, uh, now, let me see. Dry Lake. That's right. You come to a crossroads in Dry Lake, and you could go left to Sabbath Day or right to Gray. Now, let me see, which one of them two roads do you take? No, you'd better turn right round uh, at that crossroads. Come right back up where you started from, right here in Oxford, and head down the road. Uh, you go right down the road in the direction of Otis Field and Casco. Now, that's a, a lumpier road. That's why I didn't recommend it in the first place. But you, you head on down there until you, until you get to Raymond. Now, when you get to Raymond, you're going to get into some problems because they got one of them, them newfangled traffic circles. And you go around that traffic circle, uh, and you take a turn off there, and I'm trying to remember now whether it's the 180 degree or the 90 degree turn off there. Let me see. Go right around that traffic circle once more, and by the time you come around it once again, I'll have decided which one of them two turn offs to take 180 or 90. God for mighty, you know. Come to think of it, you can't get there from here. Well, if you can't tell me how to get to Alfred, at least you can tell me if there's a gas station nearby. You know, I don't know. Well, you don't know much, do you? No, but then again, I ain't lost. And the Plymouth boys are able, first class sailor every man. But I'll haul down the sail where the bays run together. Fight away the days by the hills of Idaho. Now the trouble with old Martyr, you don't try her in the trawler. For those Bay of Biscay swells, they roll your head from off your shoulder. All down you sail where the bays run together. Fight away the days by the hills of Idaho.
nothing like the smell of fur. Can't say the same for cat spruce. You didn't leave me many cranberries here. But that's all right, so long as the sauce is good. I'll just put one cranberry to four popcorn. Somewhere along the line, we have to say something basic about man, and I think that man is an arranger, uh, and composition is native. It's intuitive after a while. When you, when, with what I was doing today, I was just dancing, and intuitively, I had some form of composition that that just seemed to come out. I don't think the ideas, the ideas have to be different for each house. So that, uh, of course, I, I, I hope I have absorbed some new ideas and gotten out some new ideas, but uh, basically you work on the same principle. And so it means uh, for music, putting together of musical tones. And you put them together into patterns that sound the way you would like them to sound. For the last 40 years, Scott and Helen Nearing have been living in the country, first in Vermont, now in Maine, farming and gardening, cutting wood and living off the produce of the land. Their book, Living the Good Life, describes their self-sufficient lifestyle. Uh, last year, 2,300 people came to visit us in our, at our main farm. Most of these people were young people. Most of them were from moderately well-to-do or well-to-do families. Most of these young people have discovered from their experience that, uh, that happiness does not come with a multiplicity and a variety of possessions. Uh, they've already learned this, this minority that, that we saw, they, they've already learned this lesson. And they're now setting up uh, homesteads of their own, setting up communes with a complete reorientation with regard to happiness through multiplicity. The more you have, the happier you'll be. They know it isn't true because they've seen it tried out in their own homes. Once across the river Styx, you will then meet Cerberus, the three-headed dog. <laughs> Bonjour, Edmeo ici. Bienvenue à un temps de vivre. Nous sommes ici en Van Buren pour la célébration d'héritage acadien français. Hello, I'm Don Halstead, and welcome to A Time to Live. We're here in Van Buren, where they will be celebrating the Heritage Weekend of the French Acadians. <laughs> Uh, 
Je ne peux pas le faire. Maybe I should be playing with dolls or something. Julie, parle pas comme ça. You know you can do it if you keep trying. Je te connais. Tu vas réussir. But I'm a girl. I shouldn't be working on inventions. Who says that? You are a person, Julie. And if you are a good inventor, then that's what you should do. Work on inventions, right? I guess so. Il y en a qui aimeront pas ça. I know. They think I'm weird. I guess girls shouldn't be too smart. Eh bien, laissez penser ce qu'ils veulent. You and your friends have taught Doric and me to be proud to be lieutenants. Now I tell you, Julie, be proud to be a woman. I'll try, but they don't make it easy, do they? No, they don't. Boy. I wonder if I'll ever get this thing to work right. If I know you, Julie, you will. I've got to leave now. I promised my mom I'd go to a bino game with her. You want to come? No, thank you, Liz. I'm going to get this thing to work right if it takes me all year. Bonne chance. Same to you, Liz. Hope you and your mother win something. Bye. Bye-bye. La machine magique pour la semaine du 31 janvier 1977 avec notre éditeur et reporter principal, John Young. Bonjour et bienvenue à la machine magique. Mon ami est... Hi and welcome to the news machine. Hand and I were just looking through the stacks of mail we've received lately. Do you know that over a hundred Valentine stories were sent in to our Valentine story contest? Snowmobiling is always very popular in our state in the winter, and once a year in Bangor, people come from all over to race snow machines. Here's our report. At the 10th annual Paul Bunyan Snowmobile Open in Bangor, Maine, we met Mr. Dick Beaulieu. He was going to speak to us a little bit about what this race means, a little bit about the history, and what's going to happen. Next spring, the Kennebec River will flow free of logs for the first time in more than a century and a half. For Maine, with 90% of its land still covered by forests, wood is still big business. And when the industry was young, rivers provided the only route from virgin forests to the mills. Visitors to scenic western Maine this summer have been able to observe history in the making as they've watched these last river-driven logs being moved down Wyman Lake to the Wyman Dam Sluiceway. I'm Herb Zajic. And I'm Doris Bro. And this is Magazine. On this issue of Magazine, we'll learn something about the flammability of different fabrics, watch some Indian pudding being made, get some hints on planning our personal estates, and some shopping tips. Doris? Yes, and we'll see how to repot house plants, learn something of electrical wiring at home, and let's start with consumer dating and Nellie Gushy. Every year in this country, by accident of birth, over three million people become citizens of the United States. Also each year, across bridges such as this one, 
Through ports of entry at international airports and seaports come thousands of aliens who ultimately, for reasons of their own, will choose to become citizens of this country. Good evening. Welcome to the final round, the third in a series of televised debates between the candidates for the U.S. Senate. Seated to my left is the Democratic candidate, Senator Edmund Muskie. Seated at my right is the Republican candidate, Robert Monks. I would like to invite you to comment in any way you'd like on the white paper I've prepared. I'd Your like white to paper is a fraud. I would like to say uh, it's a fraud. Yes, it is. I would like to say to you that if you would like to stop confusing the people of Maine. The people of Maine hear you and they have the impression Senator Muskie's Mr. Clean, he's cleaned up the environment, he's had this wonderful Muskie amendment, and what's happened? We got a waste treatment plan in Greenville, it doesn't work. Then he says, oh heavens, they did something naughty. Um, I don't know anything well, about I didn't that. didn't say any such thing. The, you said that they, the EPA without authority went I ahead. I said EPA. But Very you, well. Well, now the people of Maine. Not refer to the people the of people Greenville. of Maine now have a facility that doesn't work. A lot of public money has gone into that. You are the chairman of the Public Works Subcommittee responsible for oversight. So either you're responsible for the amendment or you're responsible for oversight. And here you have, here you come and you in effect pretend that you were always right and yet this facility got built and it doesn't work and it's somebody else's fault. Sir, it's your fault. Mr. Monks, we are talking about the importance of not distorting your opponent's votes and the opponent's records. What you've just said is a complete non sequitur. I like it. Has, may I finish? Among the ships lost in the Penobscot expedition was the American brig Defense. This 16-gun privateer was only one year old when sunk, and her remains have been preserved in the mud of Stockton Harbor, creating an underwater time capsule. And they put her out to sea And the name of the ship was the Golden Vanity And they sailed her on the lowland, lowland, low And they sailed her on the lowland sea She passed me a heart and I fell apart When I read what it said Really willing and able Then her face turned red Oh, I'm Anita It was short and sweet And so was she That we had a chance just to meet It was just the music The Main Public Broadcasting Network Proudly presents the Dick Curlis Summer Special Dick's special guests are Tina Welch, Harry Goodrich, and Andre the Seal. Now, here's the baron of country music, Dick Curlis. Now, Casey Jones, he was a mighty man, but now he's resting in the promised land. Kind of music he could understand, was an eight-wheel driver under his command. He made the freight train boogie, yeah, all the time. He made the freight train boogie as you roll down the line. Well, I Keep went. an eye out for Charlie. I've got a feeling that he's out tonight. Keep an eye out for Charlie. Let him see you holding me tight. Keep an eye out for Charlie. We all love Andre the Seal. We all love Andre the Seal. He's the, the toast, toast of, of the coast, coast and we all like to when we talk about Andre the Seal We all love Andre the Seal We all love Andre the Seal He's the toast of the coast And we all like to 
most when we talk about I'm receiving. Fall's coming to a close. Leaves are gone. Wood's in the shed. Garden's all done. Time to take a rest and see if I can survive another main winter. Reminded my, me of my great uncle, Kurt, back home there. He told us one time that uh, he'd been out hunting up Township 19 where they all go hunting. He says, I come out of the woods there and come out into the road and there was this black car sitting there with a fellow sitting in it that I didn't know who he was. And I went to pass him and he uh, stuck his head out the window and he says to me, he says, uh, how's the deer hunting? And uh, Uncle Kurt, you know, he was a great one to brag. He never could tell the truth if a lie would suffice, you know. He says, oh, he says, not bad at all. I killed three for breakfast. <laughs> well, of course, as you know, in the state of Maine, you're only allowed one deer per season. So this fellow looked at him and he says, you know who I am? Uncle Kurt says, no, who are you? <coughs> he says, I'm the new game warden for Washington County. Uncle Kurt says, you know who I am? And the fellow says, no. Kurt says, I'm the biggest damn liar in the whole state of Maine. <coughs> good, very good. The only time he ever told the truth. <laughs> very good. And he get out and he say, now I want you to take that bucket of paint and that three-inch brush, and I want you to paint a white stripe right down the middle of the road all the way across town to the next town line. OK. So he paint all that day. And late that afternoon, the boss think about the guy, and gee, I better go see what he done. So we went up and looked, and the, the guy was a good worker. He painted a strip three miles long that day. The boss said, boy, that's a big day's work. So he went home, and the next morning when the guy come in, the guy and the boss say, you go pick up where you left off yesterday. Said, OK. So he went up, and that day he painted again. And when come night, the boss went and looked, and he painted two miles that day. So that's all right. The next morning, he said to him, you go back to the same place where you left off. And he done that. So late that afternoon, the boss went over to see what he'd done. That day, he only paid one mile. He said, I wonder what happened. Three mile one day, two, and then one. So he drove down to the guy's house, see it. The guy come to the door, and he said, you like your job, paint? Oh, sure, anything. He says, uh, you like that? And the guy says, yeah, you've done a nice job. Well, he says, thank you. He said, that first day, he said, you paint three mile. Yeah, that's good? Yeah, very good. Well, he said, thank you. He said, yesterday you, you paint only two miles. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good too. Today you only paint one mile. What happened? What happened? Don't forget, he says, my paint bucket is six miles up the road. <laughs> le suivant est une présentation du réseau public de radiodiffusion pour le Maine. Salut et bienvenue à Reflet et Lumière. And today we're going to talk about the, the origins of the St. John Valley. Now, Guy, we know this valley has to be an Acadian valley. That is to say that there are a lot of Acadians here. Right. Who are these Acadians and where do they come from? Well, you know, uh, Acadia means uh, the people coming from the Nova Scotia, New Brunswick area. Okay. But the population of the St. John Valley comes in from both east and west that is from East Acadia, West Quebec, realizing that Maine is the uh, only state in the country which is surrounded on three sides by uh, foreign ter uh, territory. This then is the story of the Acadians, part one, the tip of the iceberg. What is Acadia and what is an Acadian? Are Acadians a sovereign people? Are Acadians merely a point of view? Is there a definition? Is there an Acadian soul? An amorphous, inexplainable, a je ne sais quoi something. I love to go a wandering along the mountain track. And as I go, I love to sing my knapsack.
Waters with your host, Bud Levitt. Where's this little pond? You think I'm going to give you that secret? No, we're on the air. But I mean, he's, he wants to know where that casting was done. This, this, I'm not going to tell you that. Yeah, it's, worth, it's worth a try, bud. Oh, well, you tried right there, right on live, too. Bill Lee, good to see you. Thank you, bud. Nice state you got here. Pretty good state. Yeah, it's pretty. How about the provinces? Uh, the provinces are nice. I got to play there for five years in Moncton and uh, ended up in... Uh, up in Sydney Mines almost. In the, Sydney Mines? Yeah, I ended up playing up there. Anybody ever hear of Bill Lee at Sydney Mines? They know about me now. Really? They had a long home run into a project over there in Waterford, I think it was. And uh, then they, uh, I had a good time there. I, uh, I enjoyed my days in the, in the Maritimes. John Henry Williams here. Now, I hope that you don't panic uh, uh, between Mike Noyes on your left and Jim over here and be intimidated by me. Glad you're here. I'll try. Thank Will you. Will you try? Yes, it's fun to be here. This is, is it? going to be fun, yeah. It's going to be fun, is it? I just wanted to know whether uh, you folks uh, admitted whether there was mountain lions or cougars. Uh, Fritzy and I had one grease across the interstate in front of us last fall. Who did? His wife. My wife Fritzy. and I. Oh, you did? I, a they're mountain lion? There. They're out there. My father was a guide for years, and he swears that the tail was long at, and it was not a bobcat, and it was a mountain lion up in the Red River country, and I have Alex, to believe him. Alex. I, a lot of people have had claims on it. Maybe, I don't know about New Brunswick. Oh, I'm a believer. I'm You're a believer, believer too. You're a believer yeah, too. Absolutely. That's absolutely. the second one I've seen. I saw one up in Red River country. Well, I don't know about two at. You might have seen one. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> two. And uh, I'm among the doubters. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> well, that's all right. That's all right. It might be a Bigfoot two at, right? Well, there could be a big Bigfoot yeah, out there. Yeah, yeah. I Let's mean, catch one for him, Pete. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, so this great, great audience that we have here at MPBN, uh, I'm ever grateful for. In the summer of 1957, an amateur archaeologist was working near the center of an archaeological site on the coast of Maine. He was working in a midden layer approximately five inches below the surface and two inches above the base of the layer itself when he came upon a small metal disc. For 20 years, it was thought to be an English coin. In 1978, however, the disc was re-identified and substantiated as a coin dated approximately 1080 AD and of Norse origin. Welcome to the all-new seventh season of the award-winning So You Think You Know Maine. Match wits and wisdom with our four contestants as we explore Maine's past and present with your host, Jeff Gable. Mark, Crystal, and Michelle, are you ready? Okay, let's play So You Think You Know Maine. Maine's second highest mountain is also one of the state's most popular ski resorts. Can you name it, Michelle? Cadillac Mountain. Ah, oh, no, Mark. Sugarloaf. Sugarloaf Mountain. Yes. Right. This now is a visual toss-up, so please look at the monitor, contestants. As you look at this portion of the main map, you see... T9, R14, W, E, L, S. Please translate that for me, Barry. Township 9, range 14, west of east line of state. Yes, indeed. <laughs> In 1900, Mrs. M.D. Hansen of Portland became the first woman in America to receive a license to do what? Is this pen in hand? No, this is just jump on it. Leslie. Drive. That's right, to drive a car. That's good Are for five minutes. No, I'm absolutely. <laughs> Is that the real true answer? <laughs> da, 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 da. Can I get five points for sitting next to her? <laughs> <laughs> The skyline can be seen. Look at the light, shake that next right, it's exit 13. It seems not so long ago, one paycheck was enough for a family to get by all the prayer and a little love. But now we've changed the two of us, working all the time and still. The end of every month finds us crying over bills. I'm working nights. I'm working nights. I'll stay alone. 
chance All those who take a chance in America And here's to the people too Whose dreams have all come true in America Good evening and welcome to the inaugural edition of Main Watch. I'm Angus King. Hello, I'm Jennifer Brooks and this is Main Watch. Every spring and fall, Maine experiences one of the world's great natural events and most people here don't even know about it. That event is the massive migration of birds to Canada's boreal forest. There's just dozens of products here at the Made the Main Way catalog store. Some of them you've seen on our show, some you will see in the future. But there's one thing they all share in common, and we also share that too, and that's the feeling of pride that we have about the products that are made here in the state. And you know, I'll bet given a choice, if you're out shopping for a gift and you found something that was made in Maine, I'll bet you'd pick that one. That's one of the reasons that we're here today. And one of the others is to meet Karen Brace, who started the Made the Main Way catalog and store. How are you today, Just Karen? Just fine, thank Season's you. greetings to you. Why, thank you. This is northern Maine. Beyond the forest stretch to the northwest for more than a hundred miles, Broken only by hundreds of clear blue lakes, you can find some of the best fishing in the world. Most people, when they think of Maine, think of these things first of all. Many of us who were raised in northern New England remember a time when moose, black bear, bald eagles, even white-tailed deer were seldom seen. Other trees are used as babysitting trees so that foraging sows know their cubs are high and safe. So, if bear numbers are increasing, why don't we see them in the woods more often? I always wrote out of a real articulated feeling that what I wanted to do to the reader was to hurt the reader and to also exhilarate the reader at the same time. It's not all a negative thing, but I think the book should be approached with caution by the reader. The British, from their point of view, judged that the St. John actually emptied into the Bay of Fundy. Their interpretation was that the Penobscot was the most northerly river that emptied into the Atlantic. So from Britain's point of view, the northern border was just slightly above Mars Hill. The Americans, on the other hand, said that the highlands really were up to the St. Lawrence River. Nick Gilpin, he's gonna throw the three and good! Count it! My goodness! Now Davis inside. Off to McCormick. McCormick shot and ball net. The guests joining us were approaching halftime and not the end of the game. The auditorium roof was leaking and it took uh, we got uh, a late start. 
Tonight are the final two games that will be played at this historic site. Four over three! Oh! Oh my God. Well, that's all we have time for, and we barely scratched the surface of the past 60 years. Thanks to everyone who appeared in and helped to make these programs. And thanks to you for watching and supporting Maine Public.